gospel text for this Sunday is taken from Luke chapter 10 and originally it's supposed to be verses 1 through 11 and then you skip over the ones that make us feel uncomfortable and go to 16 through 20. Um, I'm going to read through the whole thing so if you feel uncomfortable um, fidget or something. Chapter 10, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others, and he sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself was about to go. He told them the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Don't carry a money bag, traveling bag, or sandals. Don't greet anyone along the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this household. And if a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they offer, for the worker is worthy of his wages. Don't move from house to house. When you enter any town and they welcome you, eat the things set before you. Heal the sick who are there, and then tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. When you enter any town and they don't welcome you, go out into its streets and say, we are wiping even the dust of your town that clings to our feet as a witness against you. Know this for certain, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, on that day, it will, become, it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing at all will harm you. However, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This, the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated as we go into the word today. <clears throat> Lord, as we go into your word, please open up our hearts and minds and speak to us as only you can. Allow us to become more and more familiar with the sound of your voice that we may not be led astray, but instead may be able to move under your direction and guidance. You are the great counselor in accordance with your word. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I've uh, entitled it, so to speak, called to be and called to do. They're two different things. Calling to be something and calling to do something. They both work in tandem, but they are different. Spiritually, the calling to be and the calling to do. This is true for many different things. I use the example and Paul uses it, so I feel comfortable writing his coattails and using the same analogy of an athlete. You can't play the game. You can't do the game until you become an athlete. 
Once you become an athlete, then you are able to do the game. But until then, you just got a mob. You ever see a bunch of third graders play soccer? It's just a crowd <laughs> following the ball or basketball or whatever the case may be. It's a mob trying to play a game, but not learning how to be yet an athlete. Paul even uses this analogy for himself. He says, I beat my body or I train my body. If you're going to be an athlete, you can't just be an athlete once a week for the game. If you think about what it takes to be an athlete, you must first of all take time and make time to train. Usually you have a coach of some kind. If it's an individual sport, you still have a coach. If it's a game sport or a team sport, rather, you still have a coach, but you are training with other people to work in concert, but you have to make time. Try joining a softball team and telling the coach, I'm only going to show up for the game. It ain't going to work. And so you have to make time. You have to dedicate time. I've heard it said, yeah, a number of times. I just, I can't find time in the day to get into the word. That's true. You will never find time. Because time is not to be found. You make time. And so an athlete must focus on just what it will take to play the game. Can I afford? Will I afford? Can I commit? Will I commit to X number of days of rehearsal? And once you, and Jesus uses this analogy time and time again when it comes to his being his disciple. No one who, remember last week, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back, you can't do it. Lord, first let me go bury my family member. Let the dead bury their dead. This is what we talked about last week in terms of making that commitment to follow him, if you will. And just as an athlete needs to carve out time to train, it doesn't stop there. They need to start paying attention to what they eat and their nutrition. They need to start paying attention to when they go to sleep. They need to start paying attention to how they structure their day. Do you structure your day according to God's will, or do you structure your day according to your agenda and try to fit them in? That won't work as an athlete. As an athlete, it will require that you take a look at your entire life and restructure it in order to become an athlete so that once I become an athlete, I can do the game. And the same is true for music. Oh, I'd love to play that way. I'd love to be able to play, you know, very fluently. But a few months into it, if you don't have the discipline, you'll never get there. The same is true with regards to discipleship. Now, in this chapter, he sends out 72. This is the second time you go back to chapter 9. He sends out the 12 with the same mission. Because those 12 have become the spiritual athletes to be able to do the actual commission that Jesus gives them. And when all is said and done with regards to their doing and being, this is when the end of the chapter talks about discipleship and the different people saying, I'll follow you wherever you go. And he says, foxes of the earth have dens and so forth and so on. He lays out what it will mean to be a disciple. So when you get to chapter 10, he is repeating what he did with chapter 12 or chapter uh Nine, rather, but rather than 12, he extends it because that's what discipleship does. We get discipled, we disciple others, others disciple others, and it begins to spread out in a multiple fashion. So this is what's taking place as he sends out the 72. He has now trained them, and now they are going to do something. And... When you take a look at what they are to do, he says the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. 
Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. Heal the sick who are there. Tell them the kingdom of God has come near. And when you take and see what took place, they very similar to chapter 9. They went into areas that were unknown and they followed through on what Jesus asked them to do. He sends them without any kind of preconceived agenda as to how they are going to go into this place with regards to having their own resources. Don't take any of your own resources. You need to fully be aware of how to rely on God. That's why you're not going to take a credit card, etc. And what they end up doing is going and casting out demons. Much like what the, the, the church does today. Only we don't do any of that. And the reason for that, for the most part, is because for the first two, three centuries, that was part of a Christian experience. The Christian community was very much, albeit there had a lot of challenges, but they had still been able to maintain the focus on discipleship and advancing the kingdom. That changed when the Roman Empire took it over. They said the state will do it. And you no longer have to be a disciple. Discipleship will be left to a professional class. But discipleship will be replaced with church membership. Let that sink in. And as a church member, it will be replaced with the sacraments, observance of the sacraments. And as long as you do that, your reward will be that you get to go to heaven, which is a pagan idea, not a Jewish one. The kingdom is here. God is going to recreate this world, and this is the world that we are, have been destined to live in, not a disembodied spirit. That's paganism. That's what the Vikings believed. And that's what all the pagans believed. That you get to, if you were a good Viking, wake up and be in Valhalla, not the street. Anyone live on Valhalla, by the way? Okay, good. But that the kingdom and God's interest in the kingdom was here. And so discipleship became replaced with observance of the sacraments. You don't really have to pray. We'll pray for you. You don't have to cast out the sick. And in that regard, the very power that we read in chapter 10 has been stripped away. Just completely stripped away. Growing up in church, my dad was rather active. So was my mom. And he served on council and he did a lot of stuff around the property. He, he ushered. Back then again, you know, you met someone, you gave them this and you did this and there were different responsibilities and he at times would help with communion and that's the extent of ministry because the paradigm shifted. He didn't have to be in order to do. And so what happens in this is that the kingdom of God cannot be advanced because the people that are under the influence of various entities cannot be released from them. And it even happens in the church. That's why families can have curses, follow them through. Look at alcoholism. See if you can break that in a family line without Jesus. You can't, but you can be a good church member. You can show up in time 10 minutes early and do what needs to be done to make the service pleasant, and that's not a bad thing. But it ain't going to break a family curse. And when you see the different people that are just well, I don't know if they're there today, but generally throughout the week, camping out, 
doing drugs and the other guy that was over here and I watched him do his thing and he gets off his bike and he's hanging out for a while and then he gets off and relieves himself and then just goes on. That person, the only way that we can deal with that person is to build a fence because we can't cast out a thing. And it's not anyone's fault. It's the hand that we've been dealt. It's the tradition that we've been handed. It is void and depleted of discipleship. Think about what it would take for you if you were to give, get this commission to actually follow through on it. Because this is not the abnormal. This is the norm. We have made it the unnorm. I was in Hollister. Don't judge me for a funeral. On uh, funeral was yesterday. Went down on Friday. <clears throat> some of you don't know my story. Some of you do. Please bear with me if you've heard it before. But when I was in my early 20s, a long time ago now, I um, was a teacher at Hollister. And my second year into teaching, I was not only in charge of the band, but I was in charge of the choir. And I had taught the choir some Christian music. We, we sang the Lord's Prayer. And we sang some two and three part hymns. Hymns are great if you want to learn parts. There's nothing better than hymns to learn parts. So they learn, they learn hymns. But I wanted to get them in front of people because it's one thing to be a choir, but now you have to do it. You have to sing in front of people. And I didn't know really where to go and sing. But somebody at the school said, would you, would you sing at our church? Be great. I said, sure. Give me the name of your church. So they gave me the name. Now, I'm pretty responsible for the most part, and so I wasn't just going to show up on Sunday with a choir. I needed to know where we're going to fit in that piece of paper, because this dictates what we're going to do in, in terms of the order of it. And so the Sunday before we're supposed to sing, I show up to figure out and ascertain when would be the best time before offering after offering. Remember, we used to have special music. You remember, remember special music? Oh, that was usually during the offering. You know, sometimes we play trombone for special music. Um, and so I went to this church with that expectation. And I remember sitting in the, not the back row, but towards the back. And unbeknownst to me, unplanned by me, unexpected by me, the Lord gave me a road to Damascus experience. I wasn't asking for it. I didn't think they existed, primarily because I grew up in church. But for a moment in that service, the veil was removed. And I fell on my face and wept before the living God. And that was the norm. And from that very moment, my trajectory completely changed. That's why I'm here now. So when I, when I went back to Hollister, I wanted to see this church. You know, it's been a number of years. And so I went, and now that particular sanctuary is like for the youth group, and they built <clears throat> what uh, at one time was a big fellowship hall, and I guess they turned that into uh, a sanctuary, I guess. But the point of the story is that I pulled into the parking spot just to have some time with me and God. It's been 30-some years, Lord. That's a, that's a long time. doesn't feel like a long time, but it is. Take a look at my lack of hair. And as I pulled into the parking lot, there was a few people that were in front of this newer building. And so they saw me just kind of looking. And that's odd, right? When someone comes into your parking lot and just starts looking at things and you don't know who they are. So he calls me over. 
his name is Mike, he's a, a deacon. And I briefly said, yeah, back in the early, and actually 1990, this happened. And I walked in and I told him briefly. And he goes, wow. Well, let me tell you about the new building project. Did you just not hear what happened to me? That's not what churches are about. The new building, here, come on, I'll show you. Here's the plans. Now, we only have, we have this amount of money, and, but we've been doing a drive. And see this, this, this grass, this is going to be the parking lot. I'm like, did you not hear what God did in my life? And I, I started laughing. I'm like, could you imagine if Paul, now I'm not even close to being Paul, don't get me wrong, but if Paul on that road to Damascus went back on that very road with some friends and said, <clears throat> this what, years ago, this is where the Lord Jesus Christ revealed himself. This is where God showed me his Messiah. I was, I, I was, I was <clears throat> blinded and I couldn't see and I couldn't eat. And all this happened. And he goes, wow, that's cool. But guess what? We're putting up an outlet store right here. And we're, I mean, that's cool, Paul. But this, we got a lot of traffic on this road. <clears throat> so we have an outlet store. And we're going to have this store and that store. And we're going to have some restaurants here. What? You get people more excited about a building project than the salvation of Jesus Christ if you do that. Not a building project in chapter 10. Not buying land. We're not doing the things that in chapter 10 that would constitute what a current successful church is. Because perhaps we don't have any idea what it is. But in chapter 10, it's very clear. This is what I've trained you for. This is what you will do. You will set people free. You will. In my name that dwells among you. And see, it would be embarrassing if somebody came in right now and started doing something freaky, wouldn't it? We want to be so respected that we would ask Jesus to leave if it got that crazy. Remember a few Sundays ago, he shows up and there's this crazy guy walking through the tombs. Don't let that guy in the church. Keep him out. Lock the door. The kingdom is not going to be advanced in that way. It's too, we might risk our respectability. And this is why Jesus says in terms of following me, and he says it on a number of occasions, you think I've come to bring peace to the world? Uh-uh. This calling on your life of who you are to be and what you are to do will, will be such an intimate calling that it will, it will create conflict in your own family. Well, the family wants to do this. Yeah, but God's called me. To, yeah, but you know, family's important. Yeah, forget it. I'll go do a family function. Or the many different things that we have in our life. Lord, I don't have time for this. That's right, you don't. But you have to make time. We've been having prayer Tuesdays for a long time. Can anybody make time for it? It's just a question one has to ask themselves. And so as you're looking at what actually take pl takes place here, we have to ask ourselves, do we really want this? I mean, really? Or do we want something that doesn't involve what this is, because I'll tell you what this is. This is an all or nothing. You don't get to play around with this. You can play around with church. You can. You can do this for a while and do that for a while, and, but you can't play with the kingdom. It's an all or nothing. And the thing about the kingdom is, before we begin to go out, 
and minister in Jesus' name on his behalf and to actually speak life into words into other people's lives. I remember that one time when that happened, it was, it was very, it was, it was a beautiful experience. I was with a friend and for the longest time, I was just like, I was just, I wasn't happy. I was just discontent that I'd done. I was complaining about something. And you know how it is to complain. Have you complained this week? None of you? Oh, you're all just happy. Go, it's another day for the Lord. Cast out demons here. Cast out demons there. No, it's complaint. That's, that's the normal state. And I was doing so. I was at a friend's house. And um, I was heading towards the bathroom. Uh, and uh, he says, oh, that's self-pity. He called, he called and say, that's a demon of self-pity. That's kind of religious. But it's the same thing. And it, and it left. And I'm going down the hall to use the restroom, and I stop. And I turned around with this smile. Now, I had just went, ah, da, 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 and turned around to use the bathroom. He said that, and I stopped, and I turned around, and he's like, what's with you? I'm like, you just cast it out. I did. What are you talking about? You just cast it out. You, you named it. Do you remember what Jesus does? You may know what you have, something. It doesn't feel right. There's something within me. But if you can't name it, you can't take it out. It's no different than going to the doctor and say, I don't feel good. Okay, well, here, just take this. I didn't tell you what's going on in my body. I don't know what's going on in your body either. Just take this. I don't need to name it. I think you kind of do. I think that's kind of why you went to school, right? And when that took place, ever since then, never had that ever again. I bought other stuff and it had to do with it. It's not like it hasn't wanted to come back, but any time that voice came and went, oh, I recognize the voice now. And I went into prayer. And thanks be to God, I don't have, I may have others, but I don't have self-pity anymore. This is when you, you clap. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and and, and it's, this kind of stuff is normal in Christian fellowship. If it's not happening, it's because we're not having Christian fellowship. We're having church fellowship. Know the difference? Church fellowship is when you come together and you talk about church. And there's nothing wrong with it. Sometimes it has to happen. But it's not the same as Christian fellowship. Christian fellowship is when you show up and you say, Paul, what did the Lord, you learn anything from the Lord this week? Well, you know, I was praying on, on, I think it was Tuesday, and when I was in the Word, he showed me, that's Christian fellowship. When has that happened to you this week? It's because you're playing church, and it's not anyone's fault. We've been taught to do that. It's not anyone's fault. It's conditioned to do that. And so... We get blindsided when things happen in our families and we don't know how to spiritually get out of it. We don't know how to spiritually cast anything out because we've been given this scenario in which we don't have the tools to do it. We don't even feel comfortable praying with one another. So it's not irredeemable. It's just, okay, now we need to start learning how to do it. That's all. You need to have to start learning how to come together. In the power and in the joy of Jesus Christ. the power and the peace of his name.
I speak in tongues right now, but I don't have anybody to interpret, so I'll spare you. I can speak a little bit of Spanish, but that's not the same thing. My friends in Christ, the world needs disciples. They got enough church members. We need disciples. And you're it. Like tag. You're it. No, you're it. No one else. No one else. You. In your beautiful lives that you have. In your lives in this world that you look at things and go, what is going on? That's not the question. What is God doing? What, you want, what do you want me to do? That's the question. And to seek that out in his name, his beautiful name. I'll close in this. When I went there, there was a, the, uh, a uh, couple that I had known, I've known for, for many years. They were band parents when I first got there. And they, 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 they loved me. God, I love them. They, they took me under their wing. They saw how I was just a 22-year-old Minnesota boy lost. I literally thought tortillas were lefsa. Oh, you didn't get that show. Anybody know what lefsa is? I'm not kidding you. I went to the store and I bought the tortillas. I know I said tortilla. And I opened it up. I'm like, this is a lefsa. That's how green I was. I was so green when I looked at the class roster and I looked at the, who was in this class that I was substituting for, I was flabbergasted because of the blasphemy that I saw on this paper because somebody literally named their kid Jesus. God, was I green. But they took me under, my, under their wing. And now Johnny has Parkinson's and um, Diane has a uh, bout with cancer. And because of COVID and whatnot, they just stay in the house. And they're frail. But they're not, because that's not who they are. So I said, hey, tell you what, after we're done with this, I, I can't keep this in my car. Will you keep, keep the leftovers and bring it back to your house and I'll stop by later? Yeah. And I stopped by and, hey, I'm here. And I just walked right in. Hey, I'm here. And I started going through... No, we're not going to do this uh, sitting at home. And all of a sudden, we started laughing. And if you come in my name, I can set people free. I didn't have to go in and cast out a demon in that way. But I could tell the influence over that home. And because I love them, I wasn't going to give it a foothold. And now she wants me to come back next month. I said, fine. However, I paid for breakfast this time around. Next time, you're paying at the bottomless mimosa place. <laughs> There's so much joy in the kingdom. We have it. Because it comes from God. And we've been called to go forward joyously, joyously, with confidence, and to set people free for the kingdom. Let's pray. Well, we thank you for your word. You sent out 72. Well, we're not quite 72 today, but we're more than 12. So please give us your guidance. We know as we go towards the fall, we've been praying about some kind of revival. We have no idea what it looks like. Truth be told, it probably looks like something that we may have never seen before. But we ask for your courage. We ask for your grace. We ask for an outpouring of your spirit that you may guide us and lead us and direct us so that we can come to you and say, Lord, even demons submit to us in your name. 
We pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus right now that you give us the insight and the capability to be able to see curses that have been plaguing families for generations. Curses of alcoholism, sexual abuse, curses of fear, curses of violence, curses of abandonment, curses of shame. And to be able to cast those out and to set people free. And Lord, truth be told, there may be some in our own lives that we've got to deal with. And if so, please guide us according to the gentleness and faithfulness of your spirit. In all that we say and do, Lord, ultimately may you be given all the glory for you are deserving of it all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.